I'm delighted to see you all today. And uh, today we're going to finish up our discussion of Andrew, of, of uh, John Adams versus Thomas Jefferson, and then we'll move on to the second Adams. But there are a few things, since we were visually uh, uh, without our images last week, that I do want to kind of go back and refresh your mind about some of the, the things that we were talking about last week. And as you see from this map here, uh, the Electoral College, it took the states a period of time to kind of figure out what they wanted to do with the number of electors that they had. So, for example, as you see on this map, at this particular point, 1796, uh, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, South Carolina, and North Carolina were dividing their electoral votes up. In other words, it was a true uh, reflection of people's voting in a preference primary. And so they were dividing theirs up. Now the states that are gold or blue there, Tennessee being one, they had already decided that in their, it was in their best interest. In other words, they had more clout. They could get more for what they were doing if they let it be winner take all and just let the General Assembly uh, uh, decide who the electoral vote was going to. So as you see, uh, there was some discrepancy and now there are I think only two states that, that uh, do their electoral vote by a percentage of the vote. So John Adams won this election uh, because of the electoral vote that he got. And so you're going to see in the next election here, Virginia, home of Thomas Jefferson, had already figured out that, you know, if we lumped all our votes together, we wouldn't have to give any to John Adams. Now, the point I wanted to make last week was that um, if it hadn't been for the three-fifths compromise, John Adams would have won this election anyway. It, it, it would have been his election. It wouldn't have gone to the House of Representatives for 36 ballots. Now, a book I was reading this past week about John Quincy Adams made the point that his father really lost irrespective of the three-fifths compromise because of Alexander Hamilton. You know, if you don't like Aaron Burr as your villain, then try Alexander <laughs> Hamilton. He will fit as well, almost, and so the Adams people blamed Hamilton as bad-mouthing bad John Adams and encouraging some of the Hamilton uh, 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 people who were influenced by Alexander Hamilton to, instead of voting for Adams, vote for Pinckney. And so that's why we got to the House of Representatives in the first place. But the real point I wanted to make here last week, which uh, we kind of got to at, at the very end of things, was that, the per that during this whole crisis over these votes in the House of Representatives where each state only got one vote on the candidates, the Jefferson people were screaming, usurpation, usurpation, they're going to take our, our presidency away from us and we represent the will of the people here. Even though the, the popular vote in all 16 of the states was not really tallied uh, in such a way until a little bit later, and so we're not really sure how the popular vote in this election came out. But uh, James Oakes, who's written a whole lot of history books about slavery in the South, he makes the point that if anybody had any complaint about the election being stolen from them, it was John Adams. And so as a result of all of this, Aaron Burr becomes vice president on the 36th ballot, Jefferson becomes the president, and Burr becomes a model citizen for a year or two. And, and he is, he is uh, going to preside over the Senate, which he does very, very capably, very fairly. Uh, he is certainly doing what 
people did not expect him to do. However, as far as Thomas Jefferson is concerned, and all of the supporters of Thomas Jefferson, Aaron Burr was in fact a real villain because he wouldn't, during these 35 deadlocked votes in the House, Aaron Burr would not say, vote for Jefferson, I'm running for vice president. And so that is what made the Jeffersonians so angry. And I really shouldn't even say Jeffersonians. I should say just Thomas Jefferson. He was out to get Burr uh, from that moment when he finally got the crown on his head. He was really out to get Burr. So, pardon me? Yeah, he, he wanted a crown on his head. So read that book, The Most Blessed of the Patriarchs. It's quite a, it's quite a good book. And he, he does see himself as a patriarch of his family. Uh, Monticello is his kingdom. And he will ultimately see himself as a patriarch of the United States. But I, I, Thomas Jefferson has flaws. But you cannot just write Thomas Jefferson off either. Neither can you just write off Aaron Burr or Alexander Hamilton. Uh, so a constitutional amendment was in the works almost from the time Jefferson was sworn in. It was finally ratified, Amendment 12, in 1804. And at this point, every elector, no matter how you get to be an elector, it really doesn't matter, but every elector gets to vote for one person to be the president and one person to be the vice president. And they reduce the number of names going to the House of Representatives to three. Now, each state will still get one vote in the House if, if it should ever happen again, uh, 1824. And uh, they, they, every state will still get one vote, but only three names will go to the House of Representatives. So I emphasize that because uh, that's really uh, going to happen here when the second John Qu Adams, John Quincy Adams, runs for president in 1824. Now, I do want to say before I, I get off of Adams here and Jefferson, it's interesting to look at John Adams, the father, and then John Quincy Adams. And here are two men that were very well prepared to be president. Their personalities didn't do them any good. It, it, their personalities made people see them in an unflattering light. But it, I know many of you have read The Education of Henry Adams. It is a real classic, and if you haven't read it, put that on your just sort of general American history book to read. It is, it is written by John Quincy Adams' grandson, Henry Adams. And Henry Adams said that he thought that Jefferson was a much better president than John Adams was. And he also said, now again, he's writing from hindsight, that he thought that Andrew Jackson was a better president than his grandfather, John Quincy Adams, was. So he had a little distance between him and the fights that were going on at the period his, his grandfather and great-grandfather were serving as president of the United States. But he, he was a historian, among other things, and he looked at the situation from a little bit of distance and perspective. Now, a few words about Aaron Burr, because I think most of you know he came to Nashville, right here. So, Aaron Burr was hated by uh, Jefferson, but he was doing an admirable job as presiding over the Senate. It was all business, and he was really uh, trying to, to do well, but it, uh, Jefferson would have none of of his goodness, he would hear nothing about him. So it was made pretty clear by the second year of the administration that when it came time to run in 1804, that you could be sure that Jefferson would pick himself another vice president and he would not be running with Aaron Burr uh, on his ticket. And so he decided that he would run, Burr decided that he would run for governor of New York, 
Well, guess who he bumps into there? Alexander Hamilton. They're going to be, be really uh, uh, at odds of, about the possibility that Burr could become governor of New York. I mean, Burr said things, uh, Jackson said things about, no, excuse me, I had a little parking crisis this morning, and I'm in a racing mode here. I need to, I need to slow down a little bit. Uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton said, I quote about Burr, he is by far not so dangerous a man, but he has pretensions as to character. There is nothing in his favor. His private character is not defended by the most partial friends. He is bankrupt beyond redemption except by the plunder of his country. If he can, he will certainly disturb all our institutions to secure for him a permanent power and with it wealth. So you just have to say a few things that this man's trying to take over our country and that gets people's attention. So. Thomas Jefferson is sworn in as president, Burr is sworn in as vice president, and runs for governor of New York. And then because of the arguments escalating, the, 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 it really wasn't an argument, it was criticism of each other. Between Burr and Hamilton, this duel ensues that all of you are well aware of on July 11th, 1804 across the Hudson River at Weehawken, New Jersey. There's a little historic marker over there today, but there's really not much else over there uh, to see besides that. There's no museum or anything. He was brought back. Hamilton was alive when he was shot. He was brought back to Green uh, uh, Greenwich Village where he died the next day, the 12th. By coincidence, July 11th was the birthday, not the day that he was born, but the birthday of John Quincy Adams. So, I thought that was mildly interesting. Although he was born in a different year, uh, he was still uh, dealing with some of the after effects of all of this uh, when he was growing up and watching all of this take place. So. Uh, John Quincy Adams at that point was in Washington, D.C. The day that Hamilton died, he was serving as a senator from Massachusetts, a United States senator from Massachusetts. As I mentioned last week, the parties were, if, if you're going to call them political parties, you've got the Hamiltonian Federalist, you've got the Jeffersonian Republicans, and uh, John Quincy Adams holds that seat by appointment from the, the assembly of the state of Massachusetts. He holds that position as a Federalist. But that is about to change here because he really uh, is a person who seems to vote his conscience on everything. And as you know, that sometimes is not a good decision to make if you're a politician. You know, if you, if you vote your conscience and, and ignore your party and the express wishes of people that feel that they personally have sent you to whatever office you have, you're going to make some folks angry. So, he is in the Senate and he will start moving towards a little more and a little more support of Jefferson's programs and he will ultimately break with the Federalist Party and become a Jeffersonian. This is John Quincy Adams will become a Jeffersonian Republican if you want to call them that. So, Burr is out at the Senate. Burr, I mean, Burr is out as being the presiding officer of the, of the Senate. He is out as governor of New York. He never got elected. He was defeated in that election. So at this point, Burr really does what thousands and hundreds of thousands of Americans did in the 19th century. When all else fails, when you're really in a terrible predicament, what you do is look to the West for a new start. 
And keep in mind, we are a state in 1804 and 1805, but this is the West. This uh, Tennessee is regard and Kentucky are regarded as the West. So he rode a horse to Pittsburgh. He got on the horse, uh, got to Pittsburgh, took a boat, no steamboats yet, he's just going to have to take the boat uh, and flow with the current down to um, Louisville, whereupon he came across the land and arrived in Nashville on May 30th, 1805. And here in Tennessee, everybody welcomed Aaron Burr with open arms. He had no negative characteristics for us here. He was quite well received. There were parties, uh, parties at the Jacksons. He actually stayed at the Jacksons, and he uh, was well treated here in Nashville. Now, what happens after he leaves Nashville is still the subject of debate. And the honest truth is nobody will ever really know what happened. So it gives historians a hundred years from now still something to chew on and something to debate about. So we don't know what happened, but we do know that what this next set of circumstances get referred to always is the Burr Conspiracy. So what was Burr really up to when he left here and what he did? Uh, and as I mentioned last week, that book by Gary Wills about the Three-Fifths Compromise that I really found to be such a provocative and interesting book, making me think of a lot of things I'd never thought about, he wanted to make everybody that read his book, Gary Wills wanted people to understand that this was the West and so when historians said he had a conspiracy to take control of the West, Americans generally think the Louisiana Purchase, but Gary Wills is not so sure. He thinks that the West could have been these landlocked states, Kentucky, uh, Tennessee, what is now West Virginia, the western half of Virginia, and then also Alabama, which was almost totally landlocked because of Florida down there. So what Gary Wills at least hints at is that perhaps we've told this story all wrong all these years, that it really, he really wasn't so concerned about Louisiana as much as he was really seeing what mischief he could do right here. So that's an interesting theory, certainly, to consider and give some thought to. So he comes to town, and uh, the story of him coming to Nashville is, is actually pretty funny. He goes to Louisiana. What happens down there with the governor, Governor Wilkinson, we're not sure. He goes to Louisiana, and he makes a second trip back to Tennessee. Again, parties, again, uh, staying at the Jacksons. And uh, he, what he has done in between being in Nashville, we do not really know, except that Wilkinson will have a few opinions about it a little bit later. So um, I, I don't know whether all of you are familiar with the work of H.W. Brands. He's a very popular, well-known uh, historian. He now teaches at that other UT, uh, <laughs> Texas. And uh, he's written a lot of interesting books, but he's written a really nice biography of Ben Franklin, and I really like his biography of Andrew Jackson. And, and I don't want, you know, I mean, we here in Nashville are proud of our literati, so don't think that I am criticizing John Meacham's book since he is one of us, but John Meacham's book has a very specific thesis. He wanted to posit Jackson as the American lion. And so Meacham follows that very carefully. And so there are a lot of pieces of Jackson's life that aren't in Meacham's book because they don't really fit with his thesis, which is that Jackson was the American lion. So I'm going to quote from H.W. Brands rather than our own uh, uh, John Meacham. And he says that after Burr went to New Orleans, he stopped in Nashville again. I quote, 
where he was feted as a celebrity and a minor hero. No one in Nashville held his killing of Hamilton against him. Honor was honor around Nashville, and besides, to most Tennesseans, the fewer Federalists, the better. <laughs> He's talking about us. So I just could not resist sharing that with you. But, you know, uh, uh, several writers have written biographies of Aaron Burr, and, and generally speaking, they are really really quite critical of him and show him as almost an American Napoleon. So you'll have to make your own decision about what you think about him. So Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, the candidate for president, was not the Thomas Jefferson that was sworn in and took the oath of office on July 4th, 1801. He became a very different president from the Thomas Jefferson that everybody had known up to 1801. And I think if you look at the people who have served as president in your own lifetime, you will see that a lot of people change dramatically once they are in that office and see what the job really uh, entails doing and what you have to do. So uh, among Jefferson's many accomplishments, the one that most people look at as the most noteworthy was his ability to negotiate his constitutional limitations to buy Louisiana from Napoleon. And the Louisiana Purchase almost doubled the size of the United States. It was certainly in keeping with Jefferson and many Southerners' philosophy of this notion of an empire of liberty so that people in this country could spread out around going further and further west and there would be plenty of land for people to have to spread out there. So he was determined that Burr was going to be charged with treason uh, after this trip to Louisiana and back. Uh, he was not going to be uh, obviously charged for killing Alexander Hamilton, although Thomas Jefferson would have really liked for that to have happened. Uh, so in 1807, we're near the end of Thomas Jefferson's second term of office, treason charges are brought against Aaron Burr, and they are specifically related to the Louisiana Purchase. And the Constitution, if you go to the Constitution, it has very specific uh, uh, restraints on being able to convict a person of treason. Again, you know, I told you last week that the Constitution was written to protect minority rights, and so in this case, it was protecting people from somebody just saying, well, William did something I don't like, therefore he's guilty of treason. And so the trial is going to be held in Richmond, Virginia. The presiding judge will be the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, which will be John Marshall. And so the trial takes place here. Uh, there is considerably lack of concrete evidence here to back anything up. And if there was ever a, another nemesis for President Thomas Jefferson, it was John Marshall. Even though they were distantly related, they read the Constitution entirely differently, and Marshall was certainly going to give Aaron Burr the benefit of the doubt. So, he is tried, up comes James Wilkinson to testify against Aaron Burr. He did that. Now, supposedly there were hundreds of people who knew what Burr was up to. James Wilkinson was the only person to testify in that trial, and Burr was acquitted. So that, I'm sure, made President Jefferson very, very angry, and he uh, uh, did not like anything that Burr did after that. He left the country, went to France for a good long while, finally resurfaces here. He is uh, shortly before he died. His wife had died in the 1790s, 
and apparently, by all accounts, he very much loved her and was devoted to her memory. Uh, but he, he, in his last months of life, he was accused of, by a husband of having an affair with the husband's wife, and that was the note on which Aaron Burr's life uh, ended. Now, enough about Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson. I want us to move forward here with John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. As you know from the story, Jefferson was succeeded by his Secretary of State, James Madison. James Madison served two terms as president. He was succeeded in 1817 by his Secretary of State, James Monroe. James Monroe served two terms, and so in 1824, Monroe's Secretary of State is going to be con uh, considered to be the heir apparent to the presidency. It seems to be a stepping stone here. Four of our first presidents have been secretaries of state. And so uh, it would seem, or three, I guess I should say, uh, three of our first presidents have been, been secretary of state. Will the fourth uh, secretary of state here become a president? So let me tell you a little bit about John Quincy Adams, because I think all of you living here in Nashville know more about Jackson's biography than you do about John Quincy Adams. He was the second son, the second child, the first son, born to Abigail and John Adams. From the very beginning, they looked at him and treated him like a prodigy. He was looked upon as an exceptional child. Now, that's not to discount his older sister, whom they referred to as Navi, except for the fact that you know the older sister was just a girl. So, you know, they had great hopes for their son from the beginning. And you can imagine that that cast a pretty good-sized shadow on the two sons that followed John Quincy Adams. But he was a child who was easy to, to, to love. He was a child who followed the rules. He wanted to do everything his parents suggested that he did. He apparently gave them no trouble. And he, just by the fact that he was John Adams' son, he had the, has my sound just gone off? All right, all right. Uh, by the virtue that he was John Adams' son, he got to meet every single figure of that revolutionary era. He knew Washington well, Lafayette well, uh, Franklin, Ben Franklin, he knew quite well. He was very close to Thomas Jefferson. He had opportunities to meet people that other children would never have dreamed of having. And so he is a 10-year-old boy. The Revolutionary War is going on when his father is sent to France to help Ben Franklin out. Ben Franklin is in Paris in 1778 trying to get France to recognize the United States independence from Great Britain. The war is going on over here, and apparently there's some concern here about Franklin how hard he's working, and so they want to send somebody who is all work and no play, John Adams over there, to, to kind of get this, this uh, operation, this request, uh, really make it a little more legitimate and a little more serious. So he goes to Paris with his father. Thomas Jefferson will eventually appear there as well, and he has a ringside seat on the early days of the French Revolution, as well as the end of the Revolutionary War here in the United States, and then the two years that it took for Great Britain to recognize us as an independent country. So he was there, his, his father took great pains to see that he had the very best education that Paris offered. Thomas Jefferson, as you know, his wife died, and he brought one of his daughters over to Paris with him, but he immediately put her in a convent school, and so he was left 
without any young people around him. And so he apparently seemed to see John Quincy Adams as a really wonderful person to, to become almost a surrogate father to. So they knew each other quite well. And here in France, John Quincy Adams just devoured every opportunity before him. He was a very... A, a, that uh, languages came very easily to John Quincy Adams. And so John Quincy Adams learned a variety of languages, but most importantly, he learned French as fluently as his English because he was there for such a long period at a formative time in his life, and French was considered to be the language of diplomacy. When he goes to Russia later on in his life, John Quincy Adams will communicate with the Russian government and even the Tsar using French as, as the preferred language, although John Quincy Adams quickly learned Russian, and so when he and the Tsar were by themselves, the Tsar was allowed to tell jokes and things according to the biography of John Quincy Adams. Now, you don't have to look far to find biographies of Andrew Jackson or any of these other people, but you have to do a little digging to find a biography of John Quincy Adams. And the most recent one that has come out is by Harlow Unger, and I uh, read this biography last week and actually learned quite a bit about the Adams family that I really didn't know, but I, I got to the point in this book that I was almost tempted to start fact-checking because under a picture of, John Cl of, of Henry Clay, under a picture of Henry Clay, the caption is Henry Clay from Tennessee. And so, I mean, he, he, knew, he certainly knew that Clay was from Kentucky. He mentions it about a hundred times in this book, what Kentucky did to support Clay and oppose Jackson. But under this picture, uh, you see, uh, He's from Tennessee, so I'm a little nervous about recommending this book, but I found it to be very insightful and provide me a really better understanding of John Quincy Adams, in part because of how he grew up and what his life was like. So he took full advantage of the educational opportunities available to him. He came home. His father sent him home in 1888 because his father insisted that he go to Harvard. And why did dad want son to go to Harvard? Because that's where dad had gone to college. And so, you know, from the first meeting with the president, uh, there, was, there was tension between John Quincy Adams and the president of Harvard, uh, Reverend Willard. And uh, he apparently has gotten the message from John Adams the elder that this boy is brilliant and Harvard's going to be really lucky to get our son. And so apparently Willard was predisposed to uh, put John Quincy in his place by denying him admission. And so, you know, here is a child who has never failed at anything, and now he's not been admitted to dad's alma mater, and so he has to study for a year with a tutor and uh, uh, get a little humility, I suppose, before he applies again. And then he does go to Harvard and graduates from Harvard. He will read the law with a lawyer. He found that all you lawyers will know what I'm talking about. He found that not quite as exciting a profession as it had appeared uh, when he was in undergraduate school. And I also know that probably every one of us who's ever held any job at some point or another has wondered why we were in that profession as well. So John Quincy Adams, he was, because of his upbringing, because he had been to, to uh, do, watch all this diplomatic work taking place, he was really a fish out of water in a law firm handling cases. And so he will go, President George Washington will send him to London, and uh, he's on his way to the Netherlands where he's going to be eventually appointed ambassador to the Netherlands. But he spends some time in London 
where he meets this American woman named Catherine Johnson, whose father is there in London as an American merchant. Now, from the first glimpse of the Johnson's life, they live in a big house, they have an opulent lifestyle, it would appear that this is a really well-off family. Uh, that really didn't matter to John Quincy Adams because he was so smitten with their second daughter, Catherine, who I really believe very much had the personality and temperament of John Adams, in other words, being a serious student academically, but she had a missing ingredient that John Adams really needed, John Quincy Adams really needed, which was a lively personality. So they got married, came back to, uh, went to the Netherlands for a while, ended up going to Russia for a little while, and then came back to the United States. So he comes home uh, and goes back. There are several different uh, occasions where John Quincy Adams serves for a while for, uh, as a minister to Portugal. He goes to Berlin for a while. He is sent to Berlin. But in 1817, after the War of 1812 is over and after Napoleon has been defeated, President James Monroe sent him to Russia as the American ambassador to Russia. And I would imagine that at least a third of you in this room have been with me on a cemetery tour. I mean, I know, I know you have because I know about half of you in the room. And so one of the things when you go with me to the city cemetery, I always talk about John Washington, George, excuse me, George Washington Campbell as being the first American ambassador to Russia but even though that's in a lot of written material about Campbell, a Tennessean who's buried at the city cemetery, apparently he replaced John Adams. So uh, I stand corrected on that point. So he is very much educated, fine-tuned, ideally capable of being Secretary of State. He has traveled the world. He understands the language of diplomacy, the nuances of diplomatic service, and he is well positioned to be Secretary of State uh, when uh, Monroe will appoint him Secretary of State after his time in uh, uh, St. Petersburg. So now, enough about him. That's setting the stage of, on John Quincy Adams. And then I'll get to the Andrew Jackson biography, which is one that probably all of you know the, the, the framework of. He was born in what was known as the Waxhaws. It's a little part of North Carolina, South Carolina, right on that border there. He was born just like John Quincy Adams in 1767. And uh, he was... Uh, uh, his life, his growing up, could not have been more opposite than it was to the growing up of John Quincy Adams. Now, John uh, Andrew Jackson, father died before he was born. He was the third son of a Scots-Irish family, and his father had died. His mother is left with two sons and delivers her third son, Andrew, uh, uh, in 1767. The Revolutionary War breaks out. Uh, they certainly support the Patriot cause. Uh, his brothers will eventually die in the war. His mother will die. Epidemics take their life. Jackson has to scramble and raise himself. He actually had very little education. He did read the law with a lawyer. He got an, uh, an inheritance from a grandfather back in Scotland, and he had a little money. Uh, he ended up in a rather circuitous route. We're not totally sure where all he was, but in the Carolinas mainly. He ends up in Jonesboro, Tennessee, and then he's going to come over here to the Cumberland settlements not too many years after Fort Nashboro was founded here in 1780. So he comes over here, and he is a man with ambition, 
it, it's, it's, it's convenient, I will say, that he married a woman who was from a family who had the very best property holdings in Davidson County, the Donaldsons. Rachel Donaldson's father had been one of the co-founders, if you want to call them that, of Nashville. He had brought the women, children, and the men who couldn't walk that distance from the Watauga settlements over here, and he was the only one of the original signers of the Cumberland Compact that really had money before he came over here. He had been in the Virginia Assembly. He had had 30, about 30 slaves when he came. John Donaldson was the most prosperous of the people who came. The rest were people like James and Charlotte Robertson who were people with ambition to be independent, and independent meant owning land. And so these people came because of the land. They came over here and settled. And so the Donaldsons, they can't really quite make up their mind because they get here, Indian fights, they go back to Kentucky, they go to Kentucky. Uh, there's a lot of things that happen. But along the way in Kentucky, Rachel Donaldson marries Lewis Robards, and all of you know this story. Uh, the Hermitage has done a masterful job over the 130 or 40 years the Ladies' Hermitage uh, Association has been in, in, in existence of making sure that Rachel Jackson's story is told. So she is told by Robards' family to leave him. Apparently, she is flirtatious. He is an insanely jealous husband. He drinks too much. The usual thing, and they tell him, they tell his wife, Rachel, to leave him. So she comes back to her mother's in uh, Davidson County uh, because that's where you go uh, to your mother's. Her father is dead now. She comes back, and there in her mother's house, her mother has uh, some boarders, including Andrew Jackson, John Overton, and John McNary, who had brought Jackson to Middle Tennessee. So the story has been told over and over again. Uh, Jackson was ambitious. He bought and sold. He tried his hand at commerce. He had a store downtown for a little while. That wasn't too successful, but he was buying and selling land, and yes, on occasion, he did buy and sell slaves. Not only did he own slaves, but he did occasionally use slaves as capital, if you can be that, that crass about the institution, which it certainly was a terrible institution. He used the slaves as capital, not even as people. So John uh, uh, McNary is the judge. Andrew Jackson, when he came, had been the district attorney. He had held a variety of other jobs and things here, but he was mostly interested in getting ahead. So how do you get ahead in Tennessee in 1800? You join the state militia and you join the Masonic Lodge. And so he was a member of those two organizations. Well, the governor of Tennessee, when Tennessee becomes a state, the governor is John Sevier. John Sevier serves three terms and then he can't run again so we, he is succeeded by Archibald Roan. There's not really much of a political contest here for these jobs at this point in time. So with Archibald Roan as the governor, the office of Major General of the Tennessee Militia becomes vacant. And that means that there's going to have to be a vote on who's going to be the major general, the head of the Tennessee militia. Now keep in mind that the United States did not want a big standing army, you know, one of our grievances against Great Britain. So the states relied heavily on these militias, these voluntary soldiers, to provide for the common defense. So the militia is different from the regular army in that the, office, the officers in the militia elect their major general. 
and the men elect the officers. So this position is vacant, and Jackson really thinks he's pretty popular and thinks he can get elected as the major general with these officers. Well, former governor John Sevier also thinks that he too can get elected major general of the militia because look at all my governing experience and before I was governor I was really quite an Indian fighter and then an unknown Sumner Countyan whose uh, name is James Winchester going to run too. So there is a tie between John Sevier and Andrew Jackson. Now, the laws governing the militia say that if there's a tie, the governor of the state picks between the people that are tied. And the governor is Archibald Roan. Now, Sevier wants another vote, and he wants the vote to be just Jackson versus Sevier because he really thinks that Winchester's three votes that at least two of those three will vote for him. So he wanted another vote, but Jackson would hear none of that. And so Governor Roan picked Andrew Jackson to be the Major General of the Militia over John Sevier. Well, here is an enemy for John Sevier. John Sevier pretty quickly said, if Archibald Roan gave this job to Andrew Jackson, then Archibald Roan is now my enemy, and I am going to run against Archibald Roan for when Roan runs for his second term. So John Sevier does thus just that. Now, who goes out and, and does what little campaigning there was in 1803? Who goes out and does the campaigning for Archibald Roan? Somebody that's indebted to him, Andrew Jackson. And so in an argument up in Kingston, Kingston is on this side of Knoxville, uh, they, uh, Sevier and Jackson get into a very heated debate once again. And at this point, it's 1803, mind you, Sevier brings up the subject that Jackson had married a woman who was already married and still married. Now, the only reason I'm bringing that up here is because, you know, fast forward to 1828, the people supporting John Quincy Adams bring that up, and here in Tennessee, that was not news. Everybody in Tennessee understood the story. And, you know, the, the story that, that most people accept is that he didn't realize that Robards hadn't divorced her and so he thought that she was free to get married, and she certainly didn't think she was still married to Robards. And let me tell you, in 1790-something, guess how you got a divorce? The state legislature had to hand down all the divorces, and women could not sue men for divorce anyway. So if the state legislature in Tennessee, actually this might be a good thing. If they had to decide all the divorces, maybe they wouldn't be doing some other things. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to get too political here. But anyway, uh, uh, you know, there are some unusual bills coming out of our General Assembly. I think you'll all agree with me on that. So nonetheless, uh, uh, that was that was old news here in Nashville. I, my guess is this. You know, I just firmly believe there were a lot of people out here in the middle of the woods and they really felt a responsibility to get married, unlike the generation today who everybody lives together for a few years. They felt a responsibility to get married and there's no preacher, there's no judge. We marry ourselves in the eyes of God, and that's it. So I think there was a fair amount of that going on over here in the woods. And, and it, was, it was not that necessarily uncommon. But nonetheless, when they found out that she was not divorced from Robards, there was just, you know, huge, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, and uh, they will get married, they will get the divorce and get married again. So they were actually married twice, once not legally and once legally, but that didn't bother anybody in Tennessee. 
So he becomes a state judge in the meantime, and he uses his judgeship as an opportunity to actually generate some money and pay off his debts. And when he gets his debts paid off, he buys a really prime piece of land. He had owned some land over there in the vicinity of the Stones River uh, mouth. The Stones River, if you've done the greenways, the Stones River uh, flows into the Cumberland where the Heartland Water Treatment Plant is. If you've done that, that either the Percy Priest end of the Greenway or the Heartland end of the Greenway, you will see the stones where you cross the Stones River. And that was really the best land. The Donaldsons owned a whole lot of it. It was by far the best land in Davidson County. So he is really pretty much rough, well suited to life here. He thrives in his various positions. And by the time he bought this piece of land that he names the Hermitage, uh, he owns at least 20 slaves. Now, there's a professor at Cumberland University in Lebanon named Mark Cheatham, who is very much a Jacksonian historian, and he's written a biography of Jackson's nephew, Andrew Jackson Donaldson, but he also has a a biography, but like Meacham's, his has a point. And so what Mark Cheatham wants to do is posit Jackson as a Southerner, and that's the subtitle of his book, Andrew Jackson, Southerner. And so he makes the case that everything Jackson did was to enhance his image as a Southern gentleman. You know, he, he campaigned as a man of the frontier, but he was remarkably well self-educated. He did not have a lot of formal education, but he loved books. When he acquired a little money, he bought books. He had a very fine library for Nashville. But like a lot of other Southerners who aspire to be gentlemen, he also did a fair amount of gambling. He loved horses. He loved to race horses and he loved cockfights. So Jackson has a lot of characteristics that a lot of Southern gentlemen have that sometimes get criticized here along the way. Now, the big issue about Jackson's past really becomes the fact that in 1809, he shot Charles Dickinson and killed him in a duel. Now, just a little smidgen of the backstory there. Jackson had gone off to Virginia and bought a horse. Now, this is my, I'll get, these are my pictures from last week. I put them on here. He buys a horse named Truxton. Now, obviously, there was no painting of, this is humor, this is humor. I don't, I couldn't find a painting of Truxton, but we have a bank in Nashville that used to be the Nashville Bank what was it? National Bank of Commerce or something like that? Same building, they just changed their name to Truxton. So for all of you that drive by there on Harding Road, you know the Bellmead Kroger's is on one side and this uh, bank is on the other, they didn't just pull Truxton out of the thin air. It, it does have a name, but since I couldn't, couldn't find a picture of a horse, I thought this would be, be good for you all here to, to, break up, to break up the tediousness of the lecture. So, anyway, he has this horse that he's really saying is the best race horse in the South. Come and get me, boys. Well, here living over here, not too far from the Truxton Bank, you know we're bowling in across this West End Avenue. Uh, there was John Irwin. John Irwin had a very nice horse himself called Plowboy, and so they, they are created a race between Truxton and Plowboy. Truxton is, is considered by Jackson to be unbeatable. Well, Plowboy, wouldn't you know it, he never gets to race against Truxton because he comes up lame shortly before the race. So the rules of horse racing like this are that if you have to withdraw your horse for any reason, 
you have to pay the owner of the other horse as if you had lost the race. So, John Irwin is going to pay Jackson, and he does that very promptly uh, without any problem whatsoever. So he pays Jackson his money with, among other things, some bonds. And his daughter, Irwin's daughter, was married to Charles Dickinson. Charles Dickinson hated Jackson, and he wasn't really too interested in keeping that a secret. So when Jackson started criticizing these bonds that he had received in fair payment for this horse race, uh, Dickinson gets angry at him for criticizing his father-in-law's honor. And so then Dickinson will escalate the conversation and guess what Dickinson brings up during this debate here between them? He makes a few snide comments about dear Rachel Jackson. Uh, and so he was drunk when this conversation took place. And to Dickinson's credit, he later apologized for what he had said about Rachel. But the words were out there. And Jackson was really, really angry uh, at this whole situation. He despised Dickinson. And so the argument between Dickinson and Jackson is not just a brief argument, let's go over here and shoot it out. It lasted for a year and a half. They argued back and forth. And so... In the Nashville Review, a local newspaper here, uh, Dixon, who is regarded, he has a skill, he has a marketable skill in Tennessee. He is re regarded as one of the best marksmen in the area. He is quoted in the review as saying, Andrew Jackson is a worthless scoundrel, a poltroon and a coward. What can you do, Mr. Jackson? You don't have any choice here. This is, there's not, not any question. You've got to challenge this guy to a duel because you're a southerner and it has, he has questioned your honor. So, on May the 30th, 1806, they go across the border into Kentucky whereupon the duel takes place. Jackson, there's lots of speculation about what happened about this. Jackson has this big overcoat, and he's very skinny, you know. He's very thin, has this big overcoat. So you're kind of shooting, assuming his body is in there when it may not be on the side. <laughs> and so, um, nonetheless, they go up there, and Dickinson... Uh, is going to shoot first. And so Dickinson shoots, and, the, the, you know, I think that the Jacksons were hoping that it would, would, he would miss or it would be superficial, and uh, he, he didn't miss. He hit Jackson, but he hit him away from the heart, I think kind of up here in one of these muscles, but it, you doctors can straighten me out on where he what was... Uh, critical in what was not to be hit in your chest. But Jackson stood there. It's now his time to fight and, and to shoot back. And so the general's going to get up and shoot. And so he takes deliberate aim very slowly at Dickinson. And his gun, this first shot, the pistol was stuck at half cock. So it didn't go off. Well, you would like to think that, well, that's the end of it. They've each had a shot. That's it. Yours went on, didn't go off too bad. But no, the rule said that Jackson got a second shot. So with a bullet in his chest, this sort of reminds you of Teddy Roosevelt, if you've read those biographies of him. With a bullet in his chest, he gets up and takes dead aim at Dickinson and hit him. Uh, he bled to death right there on the spot. He was buried on his father-in-law's property 
uh, I think the name of that uh, plantation, that farm was called Peach Blossom. You know where I'm talking about where, uh, uh, again, uh, not too far from here. And uh, for years and years, I mean literally 100 years, people have been looking for Dickinson. Well, about five years ago, they finally found his body exactly where everybody thought he would been, had been buried. So he was with great fanfare uh, disinterred and taken to the Nashville City Cemetery where he has been reburied uh, again out there. Now, Jackson's reputation. Jackson uh, is a hothead. His reputation is worse after this duel. So Jackson uh, is not regarded as a candidate for anything until there's a good war for Jackson to show his military leadership skills in. And that is the War of 1812, which is really two wars. You've got a war against the Creeks, or just Indians in general, if you want to put it more broadly and bluntly. You've got these Indian wars, but you've also got this war with Great Britain going on. So Jackson leads our militia. He had to wait about six weeks to recover from yet another little bullet injury. He had had a barroom brawl downtown with the Benton brothers, Thomas Hart Benton and Jesse Benton. And so he had to wait till he could get on his horse to lead our militia down there to fight the Creeks. But he is victorious at an enormous battle called the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. Uh, Tom Cannon, who works at the State, Muse uh, the State Archives, call this battle a slow and laborious slaughter of the Creeks. So in, in honor of the victory at Horseshoe Bend, Jackson, after he negotiates the peace, will be sent to New Orleans uh, as a part of the regular United States Army where it's his job to keep Great Britain from uh, coming up the Mississippi River. And this is where these two lives will finally intersect. Andrew Jackson is sent down to New Orleans with our boys, the Tennessee militia, and he puts together a ragtag army. They get a defensive position out from the city of New Orleans on that little peninsula on a rice plantation called Palmet. And they get themselves lined up. He takes pirates. He takes uh, slaves. He takes anybody he can get who knows how to shoot a gun and puts them into his army. And he even took some Kentucky folks. So that's a little <laughs> Kentucky. Uh, so, so the Kentuckians apparently turned out to be better shots than the Tennesseans. But you're shooting those old muskets, which I don't think you can hit the wall hardly with. But anyway, it's a great victory. Now, this is where their lives intersect. It is the Battle of New Orleans, which is the battle that really made this man president of the United States. The Battle of New Orleans is fought on January 8, 1815. Two weeks before, on December 24th, in December 24th, in Ghent, Belgium, there are a group of Americans there who are desperately trying to negotiate a peace treaty with Great Britain. This war has been a terrible mistake. We've got to cut our losses. We've got to get out. John Quincy Adams is one of the negotiators sent by President Monroe, Madison, President Monroe, to negotiate the treaty. The War of 1812 by treaty ended on December 24, 1814. However, you know that in the United States, the president just can't have a treaty executed. The Senate has to ratify the treaty. So when the Battle of New Orleans took place, no one in the United States knew that the treaty had been signed. Had Great Britain won that battle, Major Pakenham, uh, the leader of the force that Jackson destroyed, might have just gone right on up the Mississippi River and might have done what people were fearful 
that Napoleon might do, which is invade the United States from the West. So you can't say, well, what a wasted battle, but this battle put Andrew Jackson on the map. And immediately people are saying, he is the second George Washington. People will not say anything about the end of the War of 1812 except that Jackson won the war. And we like heroes in this country, and so Jackson won the war, and we are celebrating all over the country, except for maybe in New England, where they didn't really think we needed to be going to war with uh, Great Britain in the first place. So if the first war for independence was from Great Britain was fought by George Washington because he won it and given credit for it, this second war for our independence against Great Britain, it seems that the general who won that must be the second George Washington. Didn't you all learn how to do that in uh, Algebra 1? If A equals B. And so, so the Tennesseans are not the only ones on the Andrew Jackson for President bandwagon very quickly after this battle. There are lots of others who really think this man has leadership potential. Now, as you can see, I have talked too long. So, this is what we're going to do. I was really hoping to get through the election, but it's just too juicy for me to pass up and, and give it short shrift here in seven minutes. So, here is your opportunity, and I want to hear from you. Tell, and I will repeat the question since I've got this microphone on, but if you have a comment, if you have a statement, whatever you want, if you've got a question or something to clarify that I didn't make clear, uh, raise your hand and I will come to you and repeat your question. Yes? Well, how could Aaron Burr still be the vice president? The Senate didn't question it. It was, the duel was by the rules of dueling. And so although he was charged with murder, uh, he was still the vice president. And you know, the funny thing about that, after he had shot Alexander Hamilton, he actually presided over the impeachment trial of Judge Samuel Chase. Samuel Chase had been put on the court by George Washington, and Jefferson was determined to get all Federalist judges off the bench, and, and it was really easy to go after Samuel Chase because like a lot of other people, he drank too much and sometimes behaved improperly. But um, that, that trial is, is a, a great trial to look up and read, but Burr presided over that trial in the Senate uh, to impeach Samuel Chase. So, so that's a fascinating little piece of history. Yes, Marvin. The War of eighteen twelve. Uh, the war. Uh, well, what were the, the question is what were these wars called at, at called at the time they were taking place, or shortly after they took place? And the Revolutionary War, if you were, it depends on your perspective. If you were in England, it was called the Rebellion. And so over here, it was called mostly the War for Independence. And you know, uh, that, was, that was generally what that war was called. And honestly, you know what they call the War of 1812? They called it Mr. Madison's War because never has the United States been so unprepared to go to war. You know, we didn't want a big standing army. And guess what had happened the year before? With the Republicans in full command, the Jeffersonian Republicans, not the current Republican Party, with the Jeffersonian Republicans in full command in 1811, they let the Bank of the United States die, and the country didn't have any money to pay for the war, and poor President Madison was desperate 
totally desperate, couldn't even pay his soldiers. So after the war is over, before Madison went out of office, Congress, and he signed it into law, uh, passed the uh, bill to charter the Second Bank of the United States. And actually, mentioning the Second Bank of the United States uh, is going to tie us back to Jackson, who killed that bank when he was president as well. So they call it Mr. Madison's War. Uh, and uh, it was a war against Great Britain. But we in Tennessee, we didn't really see ourselves as fighting Great Britain. We were pushing the Indians out. And so as a result of the treaties that were signed, the Creeks signed a treaty, the Chickasaws, which were in West Tennessee, signed a treaty, the Choctaws in Mississippi signed a treaty, all, virtually all of Alabama, Mississippi, and West Tennessee was suddenly open to settlement. The Indians are pushed out. So the Cherokees are the only Indians hanging on by 1820. And guess who is one of the four big land owners, land speculators in West Tennessee? Andrew Jackson, who negotiated this, what was euphemistically referred to as the Jackson Purchase, but it was really pushing the Chickasaws out. So you know the names of three of these big names, uh, uh, men, Andrew Jackson, James Winchester, John Overton, the fourth one who only had one place in Nashville's history. Any of you go to the downtown YMCA? Raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. Yeah, I've seen you there. I've seen some of you at the YMCA. So the downtown Y used to be on Mclemore Street. But the Y wanted their street to, since it's a short little street because of James Robertson Parkway, they thought it, since it's a short little street, they'd just get it renamed YMCA Y. So John Christmas Mclemore was one of these wealthy landowners who had one small place in Nashville history, and it ended up in a dumpster. And so somebody else, some of you who are lawyers know a lawyer named John McLemore, and he, when he found out that the signs were being changed, the son actually did dumpster diving and rescued this McLemore sign. Now, the sign I adore, Will McLemore, he runs an auction company. Anita knows him from her, her days uh, as uh, his uh, uh, dean and other person. And uh, uh, Will McLemore went dumpster diving and got this McLemore Street uh, sign saved. But John Christmas McLemore's out of the books. All right, folks, Vanderbilt's going to be pushing us. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Hang on, hang on the horses second. are leaving the barn. <laughs> Wait just a second. Can't get it off. Pull it. <laughs> I am not a mechanical person. Okay, thank you. Just a reminder for next week, we will not be here. We will be at the...